Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webcast today. We are going to learn about the landmark decision in the Authors Guild v. Hathi Trust case uh, handed down by Judge Harold Bayer of the Southern District of New York on October 10th. And we are uh, very lucky to have as our speakers today uh, four attorneys who participated in the case um, who are going to tell us a little bit more a little bit more about the case and its meaning. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Jonathan Band, uh, who is the principal uh, practitioner at Policy Bandwidth PLLC. He's going to tell us a little bit about fair use in Section 108. And uh, skipping over, we're going to talk then, and we're going to hear then from Jason Schultz, who is uh, faculty at the University of California Berkeley School of Law and at the New York University School of Law. And he's going to tell us a little bit about mass digitization for search and other non-expressive uses. Uh, then we'll hear about Daniel F. Gold. And hear from Daniel F. Goldstein, who is a, a principal partner at Brown, Goldstein, and Levy, uh, who's going to tell us a little about, about about technology accessibility and copyright. Dan was uh, is of counsel to the National Federation for the Blind. And then we'll finally hear from Peter Yahtzee, who's a professor at the American University Washington College of Law, who's going to tell us a little bit about transformative repurposing and how this decision fits in with the ARL Code of Best Practices. Uh, before we get going, though, I want to uh, give you a little bit of a history lesson, a very quick one. As I'm sure you all know, this litigation involves the mass digitization of books uh, from the collections of research libraries, uh, millions of books, tens of millions of books, and the library's use of those digital scans for preservation, accessibility, and search via a central repository that is managed by the Hathi Trust. The suit was supposedly initiated in response to a small pilot project around orphan works at the University of Michigan, but in fact, the complaint alleged that everything Hati does with its uh, scans, uh, from preservations, from soup to nuts, is an infringement. And the uh, Authors Guild and its uh, fellow plaintiffs asked the court to pull the plug on the Hati Trust uh, scans and impound those scans until Congress decides uh, that they should get a specific exception. Uh, now, as this uh, as this chart shows, which Jonathan Band put together with our with our uh, very helpful colleague Tricia Donovan, um, this Hati litigation is part of a family of lawsuits revolving around the Google Library project. And although it was the last suit filed, it is the first one to come to a resolution, a testament to Judge Bayer's efficiency. Uh, and it was a total win for libraries on basically every single front uh, that, the, that the judge could possibly have ruled on anyway. Uh, judge Bayer re rightly refused to rule on the Michigan Orphan Works pilot because it's been suspended and who knows what it's going to look like. So uh, he will have to wait and see what happens with that before anybody gets to sue on it. Um, but for every other claim, uh, Judge Bayer sided with the libraries and with the trust and, importantly, with the blind and the print disabled, um, saying that all of Hathi Trust uses are strongly protected by exceptions in the Copyright Act, especially fair use. Uh, so with that sort of overview and background, let me turn it over. Oh, and I have to, I have to put this quote on the screen. This is the best part. Uh, Judge Bayer concludes his opinion saying, I cannot imagine a definition of fair use that would not encompass the transformative uses made by defendants' mass digitization project and would require that I terminate this invaluable contribution to the progress of science and cultivation of the arts that at the same time effectuates the ideals espoused by the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's, uh, uh, you can't, you know, there's no equivocation here. This is a huge win for the defendants. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Jonathan Band to tell us a little bit about fair use in Section 108. Um, oh, and I should also say before Jonathan starts, Jonathan is the co-author of two different briefs, um, both filed on behalf of the Library Copyright Alliance and one co-authored with the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, in this case to defend the rights of libraries. So we are especially excited to have been vindicated there, and we have Jonathan to thank in part. So Jonathan, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Brandon. Um, and as Brandon indicated, we one of the briefs that we uh, filed in the case dealt with the section, uh, the relationship between Section 107 and 108. And so what the Authors Guild said uh, initially in their complaint and then um, in, in, in a motion uh, that they filed, they basically said that uh, fair use was not available to Hathi Trust uh, because uh, uh, what, Hathi, what Hathi Trust was doing was going well beyond what was in Section 108, and that 108, in essence, defines uh, the scope of what is permissible, the permissible range of uh, reproductions and distributions available to libraries. 
So, so as you all know, Section 108 is the section in the Copyright Act that provides specific exceptions for libraries, for things like uh, 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 preservation and for interlibrary loan. Uh, and 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 the uh, the guild the argument the guild was making was that uh, uh, 108 was you know sort of carefully drafted during the uh, the the, the, the uh, during the legislative process that led up to the 1976 Act, uh, and that it is, basically constitutes the totality of what uh, libraries are allowed to do with respect to uh, reproduction and distribution. Um, and that uh, fair use is not available to libraries to the extent they want to exceed what uh, is available under uh, Section uh, uh, 108. So that uh, was a very alarming uh, art uh, argument for us, uh, for the library community. Uh, because if it was true, if, if 108 did define the extent of what's available to libraries, then what about library lending under the first sale doctrine? You know, the first sale doctrine, in essence, is an exception to the distribution right, and it's outside of 108. And, and if you look at uh, the language of Section 109A, it doesn't say anything about libraries. So, you know, if you, if you take the uh, Authors Guild argument to its logical uh, conclusion, uh, then uh, you would not be able, the library would not be able to lend a book. But that exception, 109A, is not available to libraries. And then there's a lot of other uh, reproductions and distributions libraries engage in all the time. Uh, you know, libraries, of course, provide Internet access. Uh, uh, Internet access involves the making of RAM copies, uh, random access memory copies. Also, when you turn on the computer, you have, uh, you, you make, uh, you, you boot up the computer, uh, and, and that could lead to uh, exception, you know, the, the, that could lead to infringement, with, uh, copies that would otherwise be infringements but for Section 117 of the Copyright Act. Uh, you have the Chafee Amendment, uh, which we'll hear, be, be hearing a little bit more about later, but that, that's the provision that allows uh, uh, authorized entities to make uh, copies uh, for the print disabled. Uh, and and again, it doesn't. It talks about authorized entities, but it doesn't talk about libraries. So, is, it, would a library be, you know, because that goes beyond what's permitted uh, under Section uh, 108? Would that be available to libraries? Um, and, and finally, uh, you know, we we, we we use the example of the Library of Congress American Memory Project, uh, where the the, the the Library of Congress. Uh, uh, in dozens of instances says that uh, you know they've they've tried to search for the owner of a work but when they haven't been able to search for the owner in other words where it's an orphan but they're still going to be uploading uh, images or or other material onto the website related to the American Memory Project um, that that they are doing that under fair use and now again that would be that that use is well beyond anything permitted under 108, and so we, we, we in essence said, well, uh, under uh, the Authors Guild theory, that 108, that 107, again, fair use, is not available to the extent it exceeds 108, then the Library of Congress is a serial copyright infringer. Um, we also then looked at the statute itself, uh, and, uh, and, and if you, Section 108 F4, uh, specifically provides nothing in this section in any way affects the right of fair use as provided by 107. So in other words, uh, it, you know, in the explicit language, in the plain language of the statute, it quite clearly, of 108, it quite clearly says that 108 does not limit 107. So in the briefing, the Authors Guild had to basically come up with reasons why this language didn't mean what it said. Um, fortunately, Judge Baer, you know, reads English, and he says, "Well, no, this is quite clear. It's it, it's it, you can't. Uh, it, it, it's it's unambiguous that 108 in no way limits what's available under 107." And he also sort of looked at some of the legislative history because the Authors Guild cited their legislative history, and of course, we cited our legislative history, uh, and and ultimately, uh, uh, Judge Baer. Uh, agreed with us and again came up with this very clear ruling that Section 108 
uh, uh, you know, while it provides very clear exceptions available to libraries, that fair use is still available to libraries to engage in uses beyond what is uh, specifically permitted under Section 108. Great. Um, so, should I take it from here, John? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, this is Jason Schultz. Um, so, I want to thank John. That was, um, was a great introduction uh, to many of the issues. The, the thing that's really great about this case, in, in a lot of ways, is how it brings together so many of the important issues uh, facing libraries right now around digital, you know, uh, circulation, um, the holdings they have, and the access they want to provide. And so. Um, Really bringing them all together in one case, while it was, you know, of course, a threat to libraries. I think the vindication from the opinion of so many of the of the functions that libraries serve for society, for the many different kinds of patrons they have, was really important. So I'm going to talk a bit um, specifically about um, the way in which this collection of um, uh, digitized uh, books uh, serve the scholarly and research community, and particularly a group which. Um, goes under a couple different names, but we filed a brief um, on behalf of them um, under a uh, moniker of Digital Humanities. And specifically, a group that uses um, what is commonly called big data type analytics to look at huge data sets um, to try and understand them at a, at a sort of macro level. And what was going on here, the brief um, was pulled together by um, myself. Uh, Matt Sag is a lab professor, and Matt Jockers, who is um, a digital humanities scholar, and on behalf of um, close to 50 other uh, scholars who care about this, where they take a question they have about literature, about a set of works, and they want to look at those works in terms of all being data points in, a, in the database to understand at a, at a macro level what's going on. So, for instance, if you wanted to search through the text of millions of books to see how certain words were used or certain concepts were discussed or um, the frequency or the shift in how they're used. Um, that's what these scholars do. They'll, they'll want to understand the trends, the larger, broader trends. This is not about reading the specific works, although that might in fact come later. Um, it's about starting with the sort of big questions about um, uh, uh, you know, these works as a data set, as a large data set. And this is something that libraries have traditionally provided to scholars is access to these kinds of large sets of works, but never quite in this way until this moment when you have them digitized and searchable in a particular way. And so we focused on the searchability of the corpus of these works as a benefit to scholars and research researchers. And one of the reasons we wanted to do that is because, as most people know with fair use, scholarship and research, it's in the preamble of the statute in that section. It's one of the main purposes which um, is sort of definitively recognized as one of the reasons we have fair use is to allow for scholarship and research. And what we wanted the court to understand was this type of copying is really essential to certain kinds of scholarship and research in the digital humanities that you just really can't do it without mass digitization. It's become enabled um, in this way because of these kinds of projects like Hathi Trust. This has been done in other areas of academic endeavor, uh, such as biology and natural sciences, um, with data about the earth, um, about other kinds of subject matter. And here we're turning to the humanities, literature, understanding of culture and society through works um, uh, such as books. So we provided in the brief several examples. Um, and you know, the brief's available, so if people want to look at them. But just for instance, one example was looking through all of the books in Google's Ngram, which is a way to search through the Google um, corpus there, and looking at the way in which the United States is used in those books, whether it's referred to as a singular, the United States is, or a plural, the United States are. And one example that scholars have discovered is that around the time of the Civil War, particularly after the Civil War, there was a shift from the United States being seen as uh, a, a, you know, a plural, the United States are, to a singular, the United States is. And understanding that in literature and how that shift happened is significant because it opens up whole new areas of inquiry into why that happened, how were people writing about it, how did it manifest within different um, authorial voices and trends in the literature. Same with the treatment um, of slavery, the usage of certain words. Um, there are all kinds of uh, scholarly explorations that can happen. So how is this relevant to the lawsuit? Well, 
as John just laid out, one of the main arguments that the Authors Guild tried to put forward is that the simple act of digitization and storage of these copies is infringing. And they said that making all of these reproductions in memory and on storage, that's, that's where we should stop and that's just illegal. And what we wanted to say is, look, that kind of copying can be justified under the fair use doctrine when it enables certain kinds of uses that are transformative, such as the research and scholarly use here. And fortunately, the court agreed. And the court really was able to look past um, that first step, include it into the analysis, but look to the, the ultimate use of many of these works for searching, for understanding about books, to look at the metadata about the books, and to look at the broader meaning of the corpus as a whole. And the, the court really found that when you're searching, when it enables a certain kind of search or information you know, gathering uh, that requires these sort of intermediate copies to be made, that that's a transformative use under the fair use doctrine, that it's a different purpose. In fact, the court at one point even refers to it as a superior search. Um, the court really understood that these new methods of academic inquiry need to be enabled and that the search mechanism is a way for scholars to embark on those inquiries. So once the court recognized that, um, as most people know with fair use, once you sort of deal with the first question of the kind of purpose of what you're doing, the purpose of the use, that really sets the stage for many of the other questions. And, and the court really felt comfortable finding that this scholarly purpose and the searching that helped it justified any of the kind of copying that needed to happen to enable the search engine to work um, that the libraries were offering. And therefore, the types of work included, the amount copied, all of that was justified um, because that's, in fact, um, reasonable in light of this broader purpose of scholarly inquiry. What was also interesting about the case um, in this decision in looking at the scholarly inquiry um, question was that um, the argument often gets made about, well, but they could have paid for it. In other words, if you wanted to do this kind of inquiry, why don't the libraries just pay for it? Why isn't there a market here? And the author's guild definitely tried to argue that, well, there is a market here. They should pay us to do these kinds of searches. And again, the court was very wise, I think, in recognizing that um, not every use needs to be paid for, or otherwise there would be no fair use. In other words, if every use needed to be licensed, fair use wouldn't exist because fair use is an exception to uh, infringement. It does, it's non-infringing to begin with, and therefore doesn't need to be paid for. And that the court recognized that this was a transformative use, and therefore, quote unquote, transformative markets aren't really the kind of markets that you need to license. And that if you did, it would be prohibitively expensive. In other words, the kind of licensing you would need to do to get to millions of works would be in the hundreds of millions, and that that um, could be prohibitive, and in fact, to stop this kind of scholarly inquiry from happening. So I think, um, Overall, the court really understood the importance of the scholarship and research here, and I think that was a huge part of why it found it to be transformative. And it really understood the way you get there is you have to have these kind of technologies that do create copies, but the reason you're creating it is not what we call an expressive use, where you would read the book, but really a non-expressive use, where you're copying it to get at the metadata, to get at the broader meaning and the understanding. And one thing I'll just say, and I'll leave it off here, is... Um, there's a parallel litigation, as most people know, and, and thanks to the great chart of the, the litigation family, we can understand all the different interactions between the different lawsuits. What's interesting about the opinion is the way that Judge Bayer really laid it out, there's a very good chance that a similar analysis would apply to uh, Google and Google's fair use defense in terms of enabling the similar kind of research and scholarship through uh, their book search uh, directly. So it would be interesting to see if that case ever gets to the fair use question, and there's a good chance it won't. Um, but if it does, whether the similar analysis will apply to, to, in fact, Google, because many of the fair use cases do find that once you have a, tr a strong transformative use, even if you're commercial, even if you have lots of money, um, in fact, Google has won many of these cases, that you can still qualify for fair use. So this, this might not only be a win for the libraries, but this might help influence the outcome in the Google case itself. And I'll end there. Great, thanks, Dan Goldstein. Um, let me get, uh, address a couple of background matters first before I get to the heart of things, because I think some of you may not know how blind or other print-disabled uh, people read digital books. 
And the answer is very much the way you and I read visually, uh, but either uh, they do it either tactilely uh, through refreshable Braille displays, uh, audibly through uh, what's called screen access software that uh, vocalizes the text, uh, or through magnification uh, that is visually, or through some combination thereof. And when I refer to print disabilities, I'm not uh, trying to be politically correct. It's a category that covers much more than the blind. Essentially, uh, anybody who can't affect read print uh, because of a visual or physical, perceptual, developmental, cognitive, or learning disability. So it can be somebody with dyslexia who needs the additional channel of um, hearing the text while they're seeing it, somebody who has a cerebral or other palsy that causes too much head shaking to focus on a page, and so on. And indeed, some of the software that's used by the blind, um, uh, some communities like the dyslexics are larger purchasers of exactly that uh, same uh, software. But when I say very much the way you and I read visually, I'm referring to the fact that we don't read linearly, we don't read at a constant speed. Screen access software allows the, the blind user to do the same thing, reading letter by letter if necessary, to jump around the page, to skim, to slow down, um, and um, uh, to be able to navigate through a book uh, when it's properly laid out by going, say, to chapter through two without having to scroll through page two, figure two, footnote two, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the very short course on how blind read accessible digital information. Uh, digital and accessible, sadly, are not uh, synonymous, and getting access to uh, digital information has been a struggle um, for everybody with print disabilities. Uh, the, uh, this case involved digitized as opposed to digital information, that is to say, uh, involved things that were not originally in digital format, uh, such as print books, um, but it is an extraordinary step towards uh, leveling the, the playing field because it's been pretty clear until now that the lack of equal access to information has been a far more severe handicap than just not being able to see. So this Authors Guild case came at a very helpful time in the intersection of technology, civil rights, and copyrights. An important word about the civil rights here. The Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act of 1976 are the most polite uh, and self-effacing uh, civil rights statutes we have. They say, in essence, that persons with disabilities should have equal rights when it's not too much trouble. What do I mean by that? Well, the ADA promises equal opportunity, equal access to programs and activities. The Rehabilitation Act forbids denying somebody the benefits of a program or activity unless providing that equality would be unduly burdensome or would fundamentally alter the program. So, for example, a blind student at a small liberal arts college could probably not require the college to spend, say, $200 million to, to, to digitize its print library so that the blind student could have access to the same collection the sighted student can. But what these civil rights statutes do mean is that when there is a digital collection, it must be made available to the blind student for use on the same terms that the sighted student has with respect to access to the print collection. The University of Michigan, uh, particularly John Wilkin and, and Jack Bernard, recognized from the very beginning when Google approached them that there was an extraordinary opportunity here for access uh, and um, uh, and was prepared to uh, make this collection available once it was created. We intervened in uh, this case because clearly the universities didn't want to get up and say, oh, you know, we, we're going to have ADA obligations here um, that can be enforced. Uh, but also they didn't object to our intervening because they understood that with we could make with far greater authenticity and, and knowledge the argument that digitizing print books so that they can be made available to blind scholars is a fair use and a compelling one. So that's where the ADA plays into this case. It legitimated the creation of this corpus, this digital corpus, because it was done with the intention of meeting civil rights obligations. And that uh, a legitimate uh, use translated very easily in the judge's mind to a fair use. 
once we were in this case, it was important to establish a second point, which was that universities, if they chose to do so, could go beyond the ADA and make this treasure trove available to all print disabled beneficiaries who were recognized by the Chafee Amendment for the kind of works covered by that amendment. In other words, universities could, and I'll explain why in a minute it will be very much in the university's interest to do so, uh, could uh, make their books available, their digital, digitized books available, not only to um, their own print disabled uh, students and faculty, but to all print disabled um, uh, persons in the country. I can't overstate how revolutionary this case is uh, for the blind. We've jumped from a trickle of textual information to a flood. To give you uh, just a fraction of an idea here, consider that about 20,000 new books are published every month, but the National Library Service of the Library of Congress can produce only 2,000 books a year in accessible format uh, for the blind. So what are some of the implications of this decision for libraries, universities, and sighted readers? Since it is fair use to make and distribute digital copies of print text um, for use by the blind, one thing this means is that schools can start retaining the digital copies of print materials that they've digitized for a blind student uh, that they felt uh, they couldn't do because they weren't sure they were covered by fair use. Every semester, there is a Disability Student Service Office who is making for the 17th time a scanned and ocr copy of the same book that they've made before where the student has gone and bought it new and then it's uh, because the, the, the used copy would be uh, uh, too poor for scanning, sliced the spine, made the OCR, uh, scan an OCR, and, um, uh, and then not kept it uh, and have to do it over. And the libraries have too often done the same thing with respect to something that's on reserve when the blind student has needed it. So one of the things that can happen now is that these can be retained and it means that the quality of them can be improved over time. Um, and if the universities make use of the Chafee distribution scheme, it means that many of you won't even have to make those copies because if somebody at the University of Richmond or Maricopa Community College or wherever has already made this copy and put it into the Chafee pipeline, you've got a bigger storehouse and fewer things that you have to convert. But the other thing is that it's going to mean a change in quality, or it can mean a change in quality that would be good for everyone. Um, because to be truly accessible, in images need to be labeled. That's handwork and that's cumbersome. Um, but it makes more sense to do it if it's not just a one-off thing. And equations can be converted to MathML using open source software. Um, and what does this mean? This means that um, when a sighted person wants to uh, do a search of the kind that Jason was just describing, but the search is to see which Renaissance image of the Madonna is most used in books, the more images have been labeled, and the better the labels are, the broader and more effective the searches. So it will benefit everyone if uh, uh, the quality of the accessible books, the usability, is increased. Um, Finally, I should point out that whether you've digitized content for archival or other reasons in the wake of this case, expect that your patrons with print disabilities will be knocking at your door asking for access, and this opinion strongly strengthens their case in getting a yes from you. And finally, uh, there's a lever here for you in dealing with your vendors who sell you digital content because of the strong statements about the need for equal access and the statements about fair use, you can tell Elsevier they either need to start making those online journals in an EPUB 3 format that's accessible, or that if they don't, you as the library are entitled to do so as fair use, to create accessible copies as fair use. So that's, uh, there's much else I'm sure I haven't imagined, and I'm looking forward to your telling me what else there is. Great. Thanks so much, Dan. And then now I'm going to turn it over to Peter to talk to us a little bit about Thank transformative you. repurposing in the code. Thank you. It, it's so nice to be the last in the queue because I get to say, to begin with, something um, that I have been wanting to say for a long time about this, this case. Sometimes students ask me whether 
in litigation, especially at the district court level where it isn't so conventional, it really matters if groups and individuals who have interests in a matter that's going forward between private parties weigh in. And I always say, well, of course, but I'm sometimes hard pressed to give an example. Now I have the world's most perfect example. The outcome in this case was profoundly influenced, first by the courageous decision of the National Federation of the Blind to make itself heard by actually intervening in the case, and then again by these extremely persuasive friend of the court briefs that were filed by LCA and by, by, by Jason and the two Mats on behalf of their, their group of 50. And you have only to look at the opinion to see what a profound difference these concerted efforts to, to ventilate the litigation and to make it clear to the judge how much this mattered to how many made a difference. So let me move to my, now to my, my set topic. We all know about transformative use. We now all know that in most fair use analysis in the courts, this is the, the mantra, and that's been true for the last 20 years or so. But we also have legitimately questions about how far this rationale can go and exactly how it applies. We all know what the core cases are. The harder question is, since we know that the transformative use rationale is expanding rapidly, how far has it expanded? How far might it expand? Well, in this litigation, since the Authors Guild couldn't deny the fact of transformative fair use, especially in the Second Circuit, it did what it needed to do, that is to say, it, it tried to make an argument of all, of that although transformative use is a very real doctrine, it's also a very narrow doctrine, and it doesn't apply in cases like this. And their, their argument boiled down, I hope it do it justice, was that the transformative use applies when a would-be fair user has added very specific kinds of value which is, is visible on the face of a specific work that he or she has chosen to use. And that was their, their, their narrowing interpretation of the doctrine. Well, Judge Bear's opinion makes it very clear that that kind of narrow interpretation of fair use, of transformative fair use, like other narrow interpretations of transformative fair use, just, just can't survive in the current legal environment. Implicitly, Judge Baer says that the, the scale of a transformative fair use isn't relevant to the determination if, in fact, the use requires a lot of copying or the copying of many works explicitly. He says, look, you, you don't have to change a work in terms of its expressive content in order to transform it. Repurposing a work for a new audience for a, or toward a new legitimate goal is transformative use as well. So Judge Baer finds it absolutely straightforward to say that the activities that Dan has just described, the provision of accessible copies to blind and other print disabled readers, represent transformative use. Why? Because these readers were not part of the audience which the print copies of those books were designed to reach or were in fact reaching. Repurposing is the theme. And the search uses that uh, Jason described are likewise very clearly designated in the opinion as transformative uses. A great deal of material is copied, but it's copied for, and it's copied, I should say, without alteration because the search function wouldn't be a useful function if the copies were altered, lots of information is copied without alter alteration, but again, for a new purpose, to enable search, to enable new forms of digital scholarship. 
The judge is a little less positive about the question of whether preservation activities standing alone constitute transformative use, but he certainly doesn't rule that possibility out. And of course, because there was so much other transformative use going on in the case, the, his uncertainty on that point doesn't matter to the outcome. So why is the outcome important? Well, let me go at that from, from two very different perspectives. One rather, rather uh, parochial, although not unimportant, and the other very broad. The parochial one has to do with work that, that Brandon and I and Prue Adler and others have been working on in the context of ARL for the last several years and that gave rise, of course, as many of you know, to this statement of best practices on fair use for research and academic libraries. That document is premised on the proposition that many of the activities that are analyzed in it are ones which libraries engage in, not only simply and significantly to fulfill their educational and research missions, but also activities that can be legitimately described as transformative. And I think there has been some question about whether or not the description of these various library activities in the document as transformative is really justified by the state of current law is distinct by a sort of reasonable prediction as to where the law is going. Well, that question doesn't have to be asked anymore because now that we have Judge Baer's opinion, we know that the state of current law justifies this designation of a wide range of different kinds of library activities as transformative fair uses. All right. So that's the parochial point. The, the broader point is this. Why should we care? Why should we pause to ask whether or not a given use is fair because it's educational or worthwhile or because it's more specifically in legal parlance transformative? Why should we try, to the extent possible, to cast our arguments in defense of legitimate library and other educational uses as transformative ones rather than as merely worthy ones? Well, Jason's already suggested the answer, and Judge Baer makes this very, very clear in his opinion. Transformative uses get special treatment in copyright law, and in particular, transformative uses get special treatment, and the Supreme Court has said this, and the Second Circuit has said it, where the fourth factor in fair use analysis, the effect on the market, is concerned. Judge Baer endorses a proposition which the Second Circuit had already stated before him, namely a copyright holder cannot preempt a transformative market. So where a use is genuinely transformative rather than simply worthy or educational, the analysis uh, of its fair use status changes, and it changes dramatically in favor of the user. This consideration of lost licensing revenues or other kinds of market harm, if it doesn't drop, drop out of the analysis entirely, certainly is reduced to a a, a, a tertiary consideration at best. So uh, it's important, and I think this opinion illustrates to us why it is important for those of us who believe in the cause of educational fair use to continue to tell the stories that we are able to tell about why the things we do aren't just good things, aren't just worthy things, but are specifically transformative their uses. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter. And uh, so now what we're going to do is walk through some of the questions that we're getting. And just a reminder, you can type questions into the little web interface that you have there, and they'll be sent through to me. And I'm going to sort of sift through and try and find, uh, find good questions for everybody. So uh, the first one I want to ask is for Dan. Uh, and this question comes from uh, North Carolina. And the question is, what do you think about preemptive 
OCRing, that is, you know, optical character recognition, pre preemptive OCRing of scanned course reserve items. Uh, we were instructed we could only OCR on request for students with documented disabilities. Yeah, I think the Holly Trust case changes that analysis utterly because uh, the Authors Guild tried to argue that um, all of this should be done on demand. That is, uh, that when a blind student wanted to research, you find one out of the 10 million books that, and you digitize and scan it, and then if there's another book the student needs another, I guess that presupposes semesters that are geologic ages long. Uh, and, and the court said no, um, because there's an aspect to having access to the entire corpus that uh, sighted students have with the print books, and it can be the same. And in doing that analysis, it blessed making the digital copy as a fair use if the purpose is for access to persons with print disabilities. So as long as making those copies are for the purposes of making them available subsequently to a print disabled student should one come along, then indeed it's perfectly uh, permissible to make those copies for that purpose without having a person right in front of you. And one of the things that I think anybody in an academic setting who's dealt with disabilities knows is that by the time the blind student shows up, if you haven't already made the information available, it's too late. Yeah, and uh, I actually wanted to ask a follow-up question or a loosely related question on the issue of accessibility, which is, you know, one thing that the judge in this case said that I, I think will, will be interested to people who've been following accessibility is that under the Chafee Amendment, the Americans with Disabilities Act gives to every academic library a, a, a primary mission of making uh, accessible texts available. There's been some controversy about that question of who has that primary mission, am I right? And do you think this will change the way people apply the Chafee Amendment? Absolutely. I mean, one of the questions before was, did Congress really mean the primary mission, uh, in which case you had to have a one-purpose entity that was doing this, like Bookshare. And the court accepted that Congress Meant what, it meant what it said and said what it meant when it said a primary mission. And so the imposition by law on universities of the mission of equal access makes a library, a HAP entity, should it choose to do so. It does not compel doing anything other than satisfying the ADA, that is, making accessible material available to your own community. But it allows it, and obviously to the extent that that creates a larger common corpus uh, so that uh, you don't have to uh, make your own copy for your own reserves of something, uh, then uh, uh, Chafee, uh, I think, enhances and makes easier uh, for each university to carry out its mission in terms of equal access. Jason, um, Brandon, if I can just jump in, it's Peter, to, to extend Dan's point a little bit, which is absolutely correct, and I'd say one more thing about what I, what I derive from the opinion on this issue, and that is that the, the, the more a library does to create a, a systematic and, and, and um, well-thought-out program to create to to serve the needs of the print disabled, the closer it works with the disability services office on campus to those ends, the stronger the position it will be in to assert that it is an authorized entity under Section 121. Thanks for that, Peter. And then and, uh, this is Jonathan Ben. I just want to add very quickly the the. Uh, the, the 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 decision that the Chafee Amendment that that uh, Michigan is an authorized entity within the meaning of the Chafee Amendment is actually important beyond uh, our borders. Uh, uh, right now in in the WIPO, there's a discussion about uh, a treaty or uh, some other kind of instrument for the print disabled, and one of the issues is what is an authorized entity. And and uh, I think a lot of publishers have been saying, well, authorized entity, certainly under Chafee, doesn't include 
uh, libraries and educational institutions uh, or general purpose libraries and educational institutions. Um, and, and, and so this ruling is very timely and really helps, uh, helps get a broader definition uh, in the international context as well. Great. Yeah, the, the good news just keeps coming. So I have another question from New York. Uh, someone asks, and I think I want to ask uh, Jason Schultz to take the first shot at this one. Could one read this opinion and conclude that mass digitization solely for preservation in a dark archive is a fair use? It seems like Judge Baer's opinion leaves open the possibility that mass digitization is only a fair use when accompanied by a favored purpose, like blind, access for the blind um, or the possibility of a non-consumptive search. Um, what do you think about that, Jason? Well, it's a good question, uh, I think, to ask um, in terms of thinking about this opinion not just for this case but for future cases, which you know, law professors love to do. And as Peter pointed out, the judge is very careful to say that he wasn't saying preservation is off the table. Um, he just felt clearly that there was enough on the table for the purposes at issue um, to find that the transformative uses uh, justified all the copying going on. And in some ways, similar to just the conversation we we're having, the, the fact that libraries were central to this case was very important because of all the different purposes they serve. In copyright cases, you'll often... I often worry, and I think others do too, that if you focus too narrowly on one particular thing that's going on and don't see the big picture, you'll miss out on the, the benefits that, of having entities that really serve these purposes. And so I think the judge is very comfortable with preservation being in the mix um, when all these other things are going on. Now, let's say you only had a preservation purpose. Um, that's the only thing you were doing. You're just mass digitizing and then you're sticking it somewhere to preserve it. One, there, you know, depending on who you are, um, if you're a library, otherwise, as Jonathan's pointed out, you might have other rights under 108 and other opportunities. If you look specifically at fair use, though, here, here's what I think. I think your purpose matters. And I think if you're preserving just to be a hoarder <laughs> of sorts, right, of a sort of data hoarder pack rat, that, I mean, I just don't think you're going to do that. I think institutions such as libraries, archives, educational institutions, other people, they, they preserve for another purpose. In other words, they're really, you know, for, to make sure that we have our cultural heritage, to make sure there are resources for scholars, to make sure that we can have access uh, to literature in as many different forms as possible for as many different populations, such as the, you know, the disabled and others. And whether you're you know exactly what all those are right now or in the future, I think, is going to be less the concern. And I think that's where I saw Judge Bayer go is it, with the opinion. He's like, I get where this is headed. And, yes, there's, there are currently some very concrete benefits that are transformative purposes, and, I'm, you know, obviously you lead the opinion with those. But I think getting the broader view, the longer view of understanding that preservation – there are purposes we don't even know about yet that we might want to be part of this mix – he seemed very open to that. And so I think you can read this opinion as very open to that by preserving that question of preservation. But I think any time you preserve, um, it's, it's for another purpose. It, it, in other words, you're, you're, you're doing it to, to have some social benefit long term. And I think as long as that's tied to the preservation, you know, what the long term intention is uh, and the benefit, then I think this opinion is consistent with that. Um, and then, you know, if you have a case somewhere where someone's just preserving for the pure sake of doing that um, as, a, as an exercise, I think that's a more open question. Um, but I don't think in any way this opinion precludes that being a fair use. I, I would, this is John Bent. I would just add that I think that if the entity doing that preservation, what, what Bear considers, at least for the time being, to be non-transformative preservation, uh, it, it seems to me that if it's a non-commercial entity, he would probably say that's fine, uh, particularly if you could then put it into one of those six categories um, uh, of, uh, uh, of the purposes of fair use. And so to the extent that you are preserving for future research purposes or preserving for future scholarly purposes or for future educational purposes, which, you know, virtually any uh, preservation activity by a library or a museum or any other kind of nonprofit institution could, would obviously be for that purpose. Uh, I, I think Bear would be Judge Bear would be perfectly fine with that. You know, saying, "Well, of course that's a fair use. Yes, it doesn't. It might not fit into a 
you know, a, a definition of transformative, but because it's non-commercial for one of these other uh, favored purposes, it's perfectly okay. Thanks, guys. And I would add uh, to join Peter in expressing my parochial interest in the code. Um, in principle three, that's, those are exactly the kinds of arguments for preservation that the library community uh, found very compelling, that you know, preservation is not done for the fun of it. It's done to support future legitimate uses um, that are favored under the fair use statute. So I want to go to another question, this time from Washington State. Uh, this person asks, isn't there a danger that taking this repurposing argument too far, the argument that we hear we heard in support of accessibility, will eliminate the right of the author to control the preparation of derivative works. And, and let me just say, a, you know, the Copyright Act gives an author the right to control what are called derivative works. You know, things like the sequel to a movie or the movie version of a film. Um, and so. One could argue that an accessible copy of a novel is a derivative work that the novelist should be able to choose when and how that ex that derivative work is created. Now, I want Dan to maybe weigh in on that. Sure. The first point I'd make is that if the author has authorized and there has been produced an, an accessible digital copy, uh, then the library wouldn't have much of an argument for making a digital copy of the digital copy uh, because it wouldn't be for the purpose uh, and it wouldn't be transformative because the uh, author would have intended all along that its use be for blind people along with everyone else. Uh, second of all, um, the uh, the judge, I think, was very clearly responsive to the notion that uh, we we draw lines with respect to the edges of property rights. We we drew a line that uh, you couldn't say I refuse the right to uh, 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 refuse service if your refusals were on racial grounds. You can refuse on other non-racial grounds if they're legitimate. And the same thing is true here. The court was saying you can't, under the name of I control my property, uh, deny access to persons with disabilities. And this is Peter. I would just add that although any argument can be, can be pushed to absurd extremes, the, the notion that making a film of a, of a book, a novel, is, is the kind of repurposing to which we look in assessing whether or not transformative use has occurred is generally, it's a non-starter. And the reason is very simple, and that is that these days and for a long time, at least a century, um, fiction writers have expected, hoped, dreamed that one of the things that might happen to their material is that it would be filmed and that they would reap a reward as a result. So it's a very, very weak argument for repurposing. There are other literary use contexts in which the argument may be stronger. You know, if I take a bit of somebody's work and, and work it over, so to speak, as an element of my new poem, things like mashups, whether they're on screen or on the page. But I think this notion that, that, that sort of wholesale adaptation is somehow within the reach of the idea of repurposing that informs our fair use law, our vision of transformativeness, of transformativeness today, although you'll certainly hear it from publishers and from the Authors Guild, uh, it is not really a meritorious argument. And now I want to ask, you know, because our time is starting to run out, there's one question we all that we have to ask, and um, but also that uh, Peter and Dan, I can't ask you since you are um, representing parties in this case. So I want to ask Jason and Jonathan, uh, whoever wants to jump in, uh, maybe Jonathan first, uh, what do you think uh, is, are the odds this decision are going to be appealed? Uh, and, and, you know, what are you, how would you can handicap the appeal? Do you think that uh, libraries should be taking action based on this decision, or should they uh, sit on their hands for a while and see what happens in the Second Circuit? Jonathan? Well, I, I, I hardly am unbiased, but uh, <laughs> if, I were, uh, if I were the Authors Guild, I would try be trying to settle this case as quickly as possible. In other words, sort of cut a deal with Hathi Trust, uh, under which um, 
uh, you know, I, I agree not to appeal, and Hathi Trust agrees not to seek uh, uh, attorney's fees, meaning that's what I would be doing if I were the Authors Guild. This decision is so, uh, basically, it is so, the way it's worded, I mean, we've been talking about it, but you really have to sort of read it to believe it. I mean, they, the, the, the judge did not think this was a close case. I mean, he thought that the Authors Guild arguments on, you know, the, the 107, 108 issue that I talked about. He thought, it's clear he thinks those are frivolous arguments the Authors Guild makes. Um, on fair use, you know, that quote, Brandon, that you put up, I mean, he did not see this as even a close case. So I think that, you know, very, very likely that that uh, the, the judge is going to award attorney's fees to uh, Tahathi Trust and to uh, the National Federation of the Blind. So, you know, can, given that there's two defendants, I mean, that's twice the legal fees. Uh, uh, you know, so that, that, that's good news for Dan. Um, but, but uh, you know, so I, I, and I think if it were to get appealed, you know, again, the way the judge uh, wrote this decision, um, you know, and, I, I, and again, given the nature of the defendants, given that the defendants are, you know, this consortium of libraries and the National Federation of the Blind. I mean, this is, would be like the worst possible case to take up on appeal. So certainly if I were the Authors Guild, I would, you know, say, boy, I kind of, you know, sort of misread what was going on. And, and especially, you know, kind of going back, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Um The minute that the, that Michigan, University of Michigan suspended the Orphan, their Orphan Works project, or the Minnehati Trust suspended the Orphan Works project. At that point, the Authors Guild should have said, you should have declared victory, dismissed the case, and said, okay, well, we're keeping our eyes on you if you do anything like that again. Um, but because they, you know, they just couldn't uh, let go, um, you know, they, they are now in this situation where the, 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 the orphans' uh, work project is sort of on the side. It's, uh, the judge found it was, you know, you, you know that, 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 that the claims related to that were moot, which I think is true. And so they, they sort of proceeded on their worst possible, you know, the, 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 what, what may have been their strongest claims were irrelevant, and they proceeded with their weakest claims. Um, and and so I, I think again from their perspective to push this forward would be a disaster, and they should you know cut their losses uh, again. If I were advising them, uh, I, I would say cut your losses and get out of this case as quickly as you can. I'll just quickly add that um, one of the interesting things is you know we gathered up over 50 signatories for the brief. We had to do it relatively quickly um, and um, get that in front of this district court. And putting amicus briefs in front of a district court judge is done, but it's not as typical as appellate courts. Um, after we filed the brief, after the decision, um, we've already received, I would say, oh, hundreds of uh, inquiries from other scholars who are thinking about using, you know, corpuses in this way, um, who might want to also sign on to the brief. I mean, the numbers might mount on our side for signatories to strengthen with examples the kind of potential for transformative searching and research. Uh, so, again, I think that they're not going to have a stronger case on appeal. Um, uh, if anything, there will be more people interested in supporting this decision. So I'm with Jonathan. I think, uh, you know, the, the direction I would advise them to head is, is out, not in or deeper. <laughs> now, let me ask this one last question. There's one holding we haven't mentioned at all, and that needs to be mentioned because I think it could be very interesting and important and, and relevant to an appeal, which is Judge Bayer said the Authors Guild as such does not have standing to sue. That is, the Authors Guild cannot be a named plaintiff in a copyright lawsuit under Judge Bayer's rationale. Um, does anyone think that that's uh, a big holding? And does anyone think that that might factor in their, uh, the Authors Guild's thinking about whether to appeal? I'll throw that open. Uh, well, I, I think that that's a very important uh, issue, not only in this case, but in future cases. Um, because uh, uh, it's, it's this associational standing that sort of gives um, a lot more oomph to a, uh, to a litigation. Um, if it's just one individual rights holder, um, you know, the, the, the financial incentive to, per, to, to push forward is small. Uh, class certification can be difficult to achieve. So the associational standing could be sort of an easy way to, to get a lot of, 
uh, a lot of uh, claims together, one a lot of authors together, a lot of rights together, and and then you can uh, push forward um, and, and, and and maybe force a better settlement. Uh, so so the judge ruling that there is no uh, statutory standing under the Copyright Act, I think, is a very significant ruling, um, uh, and. Uh, uh, you know that, that that should be very helpful for uh, libraries and other uh, potential defendants in the future. Great, thanks, Jonathan. And with that, we've reached the end of our hour. I just want to thank all of our wonderful speakers for joining us uh, and uh, and helping to shed light on this really exciting decision. And I want to thank all of you out there listening. Uh, there's so much more to talk about with this case. Uh, you can bet that this conversation is going to continue wherever uh, librarians and anyone who cares about accessibility and anyone who cares about copyright, um, wherever we all gather, um, this is a landmark decision, and it's really going to have repercussions for a long time. So anyway, thank you all for coming, and, uh, and we hope this has been as fun for you as I'm sure it has been for us.